Hey, Lord of the Rings fans, it's your boy, New Better Do Better, and we are back for episode two of season two, and we have the one and only Cali Cosplay, as always, co-hosting with me. Cali, what's up? What's going on? Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another week and another really exciting episode. I am looking forward to this. We have a really close friend and a really amazing guest with us today. Everybody say hello to Lee. Hi, <laughs> Lee in the building. Lee, aka Silmarilli Ann. Yeah, I was, I was gonna go with that, and I was like, yeah, just go Lee. Just, just say Lee. <laughs> just keep it short, Callie. Don't like. <laughs> yeah, just the one That's syllable. Right. It's easier. <laughs> Lee, you are literally joining us from across the Atlantic Ocean. Tell everybody where mm. you're from, and tell everybody where they can find you, and where they can, you know, get all your good lore. Uh, I am coming here to you from Northwest England. So yeah, other side of the Atlantic. Uh, you can find me on TikTok at Silmarillion. Um, I also have a cosplay TikTok that I don't actually use, but I'm on Instagram as Celestial underscore Wanderer for cosplay stuff. Boom. You got it. You heard it all from the queen herself. <laughs> Lee Silmarillion. I'm excited. She is a super lore master like this is somebody <laughs> i look to when i don't know something i say hey lee is this correct or you know I, I just i just really am super impressed by her knowledge and it is outstanding and i can't wait to get it's into today's kind. episode <laughs> uh, you, know, hey, you gotta you gotta be humble when you're, you're in the presence of greatness you gotta just be humble and you gotta learn <laughs> to you know what i'm saying bow out wow, gracefully uh and not bow to your knowledge because it is extensive and it's amazing. So when we get to chattering and when we get to disagreeing, oh, it's dope. It's dope. Now, this is a close friend of ours. We literally talk almost every day. Um, you know, we have a Discord and and all of us commiserate in there and we have such a good time and we, we support each other. So this is going to be a really fun episode. And I picked, I'm proud to say I picked today's topic. We're going to talk about something strictly Lord of the Rings, something dope, something we both love and hate. We're going to talk <laughs> about the seven sons of Feanor. Now, but you before guys we know, talk about the lore, we have to digress just for a little moment, just for Callie's sake. No, we don't. Sake. No, we don't, Callie. <laughs> you don't have to do this. No, listen, you don't have to do this. This is, this is we, we control do, the this. People, the people. We can change our format. This. We don't have to do this. <laughs> Go all right lee you are our traveler you have been all over the place and maybe we'll get to talk a little bit about it today maybe we'll just stick to the lore but uh the question for the day is what do it or what yeah what do egyptians use to travel to the underworld uh a boat a new bus oh my god <laughs> did you just, wait but did you say a boat yeah, you know, this is a, a terrible joke, and that was just a terrible, even you know. Let me sip on my soul. I let know. Me sip on my soul. I, I was just on, I was on the spot and I panicked, so I just said boat. <laughs> boat is correct. <laughs> yeah. I just want you to. Know, but actually, I'm thankful for your response because it took some of the zing and the sting out of her little funny joke. She thought it was so funny, then it was just like, Ugh. So no, it was funny, funny though. It's like, it's a new bus. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna use that, Kelly. Ah, yes. <laughs> I have a friend who's currently doing a master's in Egyptology, so I'm gonna send her that joke right, as soon as we, we finished here. See, somebody <laughs> appreciates if one person appreciates the joke, then my job is done. That is my that is my that is what I am here for. Anyway, <laughs> I will let you guys on. get to the lore now. Let's go. <laughs> we are going to be discussing the seven sons of Feanor. Now, Feanor is a topic all in itself. He is, by accounts, the greatest elf to ever live uh, in, in all equal parts. Uh, he's definitely the greatest smith to ever live. And he had seven sons. And they are quite the handful. Uh, so, Lee, one of your favorite elves, if not your favorite elf, is the son of Feanor. And it's like, oh, you love him. But to be honest, I love them as well. Very, very intriguing. Um, it's it's tough. It's some tug at your heartstrings, some you want to hate, some you're just like, they're not that bad. Well, ah, they got caught up in, you know, it's so much yeah. to discuss here. So being that I'm hosting this thing, we're gonna start off with 
how to remember all seven sons of Feanor. Obviously, a lot of different names. And mm. we all have our own methodologies. So we know it's Feanor and then his seven sons. So Feanor falls into the Fs of his brothers. Yeah. Are all Names all start with an F. Feanor, Fingolfin, and Finolfin. His father's name, Finway. So F, 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 F. No, no cursing there. But <laughs> his son's names are very different. So yeah. I remember them as just two M's, three C's, and two A's. Yeah. And w- once you remember that, to me, easy as pie. So yeah. let's let's go over the names. So we okay. have the eldest brother who is Maidros. Maidros, yes. And then we have the second eldest brother who is Maglor. And then the now, I don't greatest know, minstrel. I don't know. Yes, second he's the greatest, greatest. minstrel. Sec- second greatest minstrel. Gr- yep. Greatest minstrel of the Noldor. Yep. And then I don't know the age difference between these three, but we have Kelagorm, Corfin, and she may be able to correct me here, and Caranthir. It's, it's so Kelagorm, Caranthir, Corfin. And then Corfin. Okay, Kelagorm, yeah. Caranthir, and then Corfin. In that order. And then we have the twins. Thank goodness they're twins. We don't have to know. They're twins, <laughs> Emrod and Amros. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I so, can't. Yeah. The, the, twi- the twins, a lot of the time, were just like also there. They don't seem to do as much. Apart from the good. version of Lost Guard, where one of them dies, that's the most interesting thing that they really did. So go over some quick lore real quick for those uh, listening to the podcast who have no idea what the seven sons did or who they are we all know if and if you don't know here we go Feanor is like literally the the son of Fenway who was the high king of the Noldor elves and he is like Fenway's everything like he is like Fenway put all his love into him because unfortunately his wife uh, Muriel died during childbirth because all of her power and all of her fire went into Feanor making him that guy making him just above and beyond and and just extremely skilled and powerful in all parts. And um, so being that he lost his wife, the love of his life, he put all his love and attention into his son, Feanor. And Feanor grew and learned fast and and he began being able to create things that even it said only the gods could make themselves. It, it, It says at one point, at some point, even only the Valar could make some of the shit that he's making, which I think is amazing. Amazing. So some of the creations of Feanor, let's get into them. Lee, I know you want to talk about them. So the, the most right. known well, thing... Well, the, the most obvious ones of the three Silmarils. Silmarils. Um, but then he also made the Palantiri, uh, the yes. Seeing Stones, which are obviously a big part of Lord of the Rings as well. They were made yes. by Feanor. And then he also made the Feanorian lamps, which are only mentioned a few times, but they're pretty impressive. They're basically like stones that glowed. Um, and yeah, they, they lit. I'm pretty sure they, they ended up having them in Menegra. I don't they, remember now. I think they, they had them. I know they had them in the in Hithlum. In the, the Grey Elves mm. had some in Hithlum. And yeah. um, maybe in Menegra. And I know, and then I know the, they the, don't, the, they the don't two, go out, right? The two who two order meet, who lead him to the gate of the Noldor, they had one of the Feanorian lamps as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, three things that are all like pretty impressive, and no one ever else ever came close to anything like that at all. And um, he also created the Feanorian runes. Of course, he did. Yeah, he um, he created Tengwar. So all the yes. Elvish writing you see throughout Lord of the Rings, anywhere, he in, he invented that. Because before that, there was another um, alphabet that I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but that was created by an elf called Rumiel, um, yeah. but then who was also a law master who Feanor then like outdid and invented Tengwad. And then before the script that Rumiel did, the elves used Kirth, which we know more familiarly as the runes that the dwarves used. The dwarves used, yeah. Yeah, but they yeah. were originally, they were like the first elven alphabet was the Kir- the Kirith Roods that became the Dwarfen language. So, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I forgot about that. Of course he did. He invented Tengwar. Yeah, so Tengwar is a flowing script, like very mm-hmm. elven. Like when you see it, you think immediately, this is elven, it's beautiful. It's it Yeah, flows, it's like the flowy, and- organic 
feel yeah. to so, it. And, and yeah. the Kirith is literally so straight. And like it, it was created by Dairon and, and from the Sindar elves um in Doriath, and he brought it over east over the Blue Mountains, and the dwarves adapted it because they liked the straight lines of it. They were like, yo, this shit is this shit mm. is lit. It's good for <laughs> so, it's good for carving into stone. It's a lot exactly. easier to carve into stone yeah, than the elven's yeah. grip. So they 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 deemed uh you know his skill higher than what the elves deemed it was. So he, it was adapted by the dwarves. So a lot of people. Oh, I just think remembered. That... Just remembered what Rumiel's uh, script was called. It was Sarati, and it was a script, but it it, it went from top to bottom downwards like that rather than oh. cross. And it was and this, and this is why we have Lee on the podcast because she knows <laughs> things like this. I did not know that. That's something I did not know the name of that script. So thank you once again for your expertise. Hey, actually, I, I did a video that like went quite in depth with all these things. And it's one of my favorite videos that I've ever done because it's just straight up Tolkien and linguistic nerdy shit just <laughs> full on. And it's great. I love doing that video. <laughs> so he created all these wonderful things, but like so many people who are so good at so many things, he started feeling himself. He got a little bit big headed. Uh, he had some influence inadvertently. I, I can say inadvertently, but he didn't realize he didn't realize he was getting influenced. I, th I think I God. think you need to go back to I think where the root of his issues came from, and he had big issues, and that was his mother's was death, his, mother, and his yeah. father remarrying because. Um, Obviously, the thing with the elves, and especially at that time, was in Valinor, nobody had ever died in Valinor. And then Miriel dies, and she goes to Mandos, and then she decides she doesn't want to come back. And some of the Maya are, like, looking after her body and preserving it in mm -hmm. the gardens of Este, who is the, the, the valor of healing and stuff. And she's like, no, I'm going to stay here, because she she's too weak to live, essentially. She decides she wants to stay in Mandos, and then Feanor is without a mother and it's the first time that's ever happened mm -hmm. and then it gets worse because elves generally marry for eternity you know they're married to that one person for eternity but then his father Finway, go Finway goes and remarries which just messes Feanor up completely because yeah. in Feanor's mind Finway is still married to his mother how can he be remarrying? And he hates that he remarries and he hates the, what comes from that marriage, particularly Fingolfin, who is his half-brother. His, uh, his, his half-brothers, yeah. So he hates Fingolfin and he hates his brother Finolfin, who both are his half-brothers. And they are, you know, the children of Indus, uh, of the Vanyar, who is, you know, the second wife of Finway. And Finway loves her greatly. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. another problem is, once again, Fenway loves Feanor, and he pours all his love into Feanor. So it's not that he doesn't love Fingolfin and Finolfin, but most of his attention and, and stuff goes to Feanor. And, and this causes causes problems, and this causes problems. And um, so, you know, she was right to go back to that point. And also, you know, the big-headedness of all these great things that Feanor is creating. And, like, even the Valar, like, looked up to the silver rules. They were like, oh, wow, I, I, these are amazing. Like, can we see these? Can we? Be, can they be in our presence? So when you have essentially the gods, like, you know, fawning over the things that you create, you can get a big head. And he started not listening to anybody and taking anybody's advice. But one thing I will say about Feodor, one thing I will say about him, he was a family man. He loved his father. It, it, it is said that, he didn't care about nothing else really except for the Silmarils and he loved his father and his kids. That's it. Mm -hmm. Like it got to a point where he was so big headed over the Silmarils. He stopped letting people see them, but he always would let his father see them and his children. And, you know, he was also, uh, was always also married as well. And, you know, he would not listen to anybody except for a short time. He would listen to his wife, whose name was Nerda now. Um, and, you know, he would listen to her for a short while until, <laughs> you know, they kept having disagreements <laughs> and then yeah, he wouldn't listen to I think to they, they eventually became estranged. Estranged, um, yeah. We're yeah. going to say and estranged, when, you know, uh, basically divorced. <laughs> as much as else can be, yeah. <laughs> that makes a great t-shirt, though. Feanor is a family man. 
He, you know, he, he is. <laughs> but from Nerd That's the thing, isn't it? Families that slay together stay together. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That is, uh, that is. I took, that took the smile off my face. Oh, no. that's, that's not cute. That wasn't cute at all. So one thing but I it, can it, say it is, is he's a family man. That was specifically a, a joke invented for the Feanorians. No, it's not course, a general rule for life. <laughs> Absolutely. This isn't so, the self care portion, say, guys. This is not. <laughs> Feanor is absolutely a, fa a family man, and even though he becomes estranged uh, with his wife, one good thing that came out of that union was his seven sons. Now he's shooting. He's shooting every time and getting sons. He has, I, 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 from from my knowledge, he doesn't have any daughters, right? Am I am I mistaken? That's there? true. Just my has daughters. seven sons, and he nails it. And it. Um, I I don't think there's any other elf that had as many children as Feanor and Nesbanel did. Like his brothers oh. each had four children, but that was the most no elf ever came close. Yeah, I guess he had so crazy. much extra essence to give because his mother gave <laughs> him so much. Yes, yeah, so he he has seven seven boys. So uh, you know, so Mythros, Maglor, Kelagorm, Caranthir. Uh, Kurfin and Amron and Amros, and boom, like they are all like gifted in their own ways. Um, so like I know Mithros is known as the tall, and he was like, uh, you know, he had red fiery hair and he was extremely skilled in fighting. And he was, uh, I, I think he was a good leader, he like he was good at getting yeah. them together, he was very good leader. Then we have mm. Maglo, who's extremely, extremely good at singing. And um, he was compassionate, actually. Maglo was actually yeah. very compassionate. Then the three C's. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, what so, can I say uh, about the three C's? <laughs> Caranthea okay. is the least bad of them. Um, Caranthea is uh, the least uh, bad. Give him that. And yeah. Caranthea actually was looked kindly upon men. I just made a video about Lady Halleth and the Halladeen. Mm. And, mm. and after they you know, were defending themselves um, from an orc raid. He actually looked kindly upon. He looked kindly upon men after that, and that's a good yeah. quality to have about him. He mm -hmm. was very good at trade and very good at protecting his land. But even though he looked down, um, he traded with the dwarves a lot. He got a lot of things from the dwarves, but he looked down on them. That's the only thing I didn't like about mm. uh, Karen there. Um, and but, it was um, it was Karen Thea who. Um derisively referred to Thingol as the dark elf yes. um, when they were annoyed because they he wouldn't when Thingol wouldn't let anyone except the children of Fenarfin into Dorias yeah. um, so you know he's quite yeah that dark elf um, no, Kelagorm is a mighty hunter so he was good at hunting and he was very good with animals he's the Radagast of the brothers uh he's the one who yeah, was gifted yeah you can actually huan. talk to animals <laughs> he was gifted huan and and he actually spent a lot of time with orme and, and with the people of orme so he's 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 the bird guy <laughs> <laughs> he's the bird guy like Radagast yeah you know, it's, i find guy. it interesting with Kelagorm because the trope of like being able to talk to animals is usually reserved for a very for a good guy, you know, a very good person. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, look at Disney films for that. It's always, well, I, you know, I think they, the I think they may have started out. Then... Oh, yeah, I'm not saying Color was okay. bad from the start, but I just yeah. think it's interesting subversion of that trope that it ends up him being not a very nice person. We'll get, we'll get into the, their fall, per se. Like, we'll get into their fall. Yeah. So, absolutely. And then uh, we have uh, Corfin, who's probably the most jackass of all of them. <laughs> yeah. Him, he, so he in, inherited his father's skill of hand the most. So if anybody is able to craft or, you know, be be a smith of some sort, it was it was him, you know, of some, of some sort. And then we all know who the son of Corfin is. Uh, is Corfin is the father of Celebrimbor. My other favorite. And you see, you see the line there of a great mm. smithing and and skill and uh, making things. In so interesting things about Corfin as well. He um is one of the, in fact, he might be the only one of where an elf had the name of an elf that already existed. So his Ooh. father name in Quenya was Corfinwe, which was mm -hmm. Feanor's father name, and it just mm -hmm. means um wise son of finway 
Is it wise or is it skilled? Skilled son of Finway. Um, but yeah, they had the same name, Kurufin. And then his mother name was um, Atarinke, which means little father, because he was Aww. so much like Feanor. Oh, looked adorable. like He looked like Feanor. Um, he had like the, the smithing skill like Feanor. And yeah. He was an asshole father. like Feanor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he inherited a lot from Feanor. Good and bad. Um, now the two twins were very much like each other, and they also were like more like their mother. It, it was it was said they were very much yeah. inherited a lot of their mother's mood, and and Nerd Nerd was cool, I think. And they kind of followed as opposed to did things themselves. As you know, they kind of first they dwelt the furthest away from their brothers. They they dwelt uh, in the south of East uh, Balarian, and and they were also hunters. But they kind of roamed and did their own thing, except basically when they were called upon, as far as we mm. know. And, you know, th that information, except for uh, the information from, you know, a different version of the story. Mm. So I say they were just kind of caught up in the in the oath and just kind of yeah. followed along with their brothers. They weren't the practitioners or the, per the people that like led the, the this and that. Each of the brothers, except for those two, have done something on their own. To be an asshole in some kind of way, regardless of whether you like them or don't like them, except for Amrata and Ross, they just followed and were basically summoned by their brothers and like, all right, let's go do this shit. And, you know, unfortunately, they took the oath, which we'll get into. So well, can I give another brothers, a funny fact about Amrod and Amras? Of course. Um, Fehenor didn't actually give them each a name. He just called them both Amborosa. Like cool. they're both called Amborosa. He didn't even bother to give them other names. And then one of them, Nerdanel, called Umbarto, and then Fe which meant the fated one. And Feanor thought that sounded sinister. She's like, you can't call them that. So she changed yeah. it to Umbarto. <laughs> but yeah, it's the fact that, and they, they used to just refer to themselves and each other as Amborosa because mm. I suppose they were always together. They were twins, they looked similar. So they were just both. Amborosa, and it was literally both of their names. <laughs> Fey and I didn't even bother giving them each a name. Yeah. So now we we got the seven sons of Fey and Or down, and you know Lee has a favorite. She has a definite favorite. We talk about this all the time. Who is your favorite of the seven sons of Fey and Or? Mythros, all day long. Mythros, the tall love of my he, life. He is the he is by far the leader of the of they listen to him. He's the eldest, and they actually listen to everything he says. If he says something, the other brothers are following behind him. And he he can like he has the most pull and he sways their decisions heavily. Like, you know, when he says something, it goes, and even if they get out of line, he'll scold them or whatever. Make he makes the decisions for the most part, and they listen to him. Um, uh, so absolutely, I I, I understand. Mythros being your favorite, not only for that, but he was extremely skilled in fighting. With extremely skilled, like even when he only had one hand, he had one hand, and it said he became more deadly with that hand than when he had both. Like with the other hand, mm -hmm. when he had the other hand, and it's it's amazing. And he's somebody who does bad deeds, but very much does not like he doesn't do it out of hate. Or it's, it's, yeah, he's it's hard like to he, pin down. He doesn't have a choice. Like it, it's it's difficult yeah. to explain the oath and how it it basically compelled them to do it. They kind of them. They weren't by that point. Yeah, they weren't choosing to go and do these things. They literally couldn't not. It's 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 difficult to explain it. Um, but that's the power of oaths, and particularly on swearing on a luvatar. Don't do that. <laughs> So yeah, but but also like I think he he felt the responsibility of that, and also like where he positioned himself. So where his fortress Himring was was like he was the front line, oh, first the front line, line. Defense between Angband and Morgoth and the rest of Beleriand. So when Morgoth came out, it was Mithros who was right there, and then Maglord was like just sort of was nearby as well in the gap of Maglord. Yeah, um, absolutely, which is so, a very know, brave deed. Yeah, yeah, very brave deed. And he also organized, he also organized the fifth battle. Yeah. 
the Union of Maedros, which is where they came the closest they ever did to overthrowing Morgoth. And this is where the seas come in as well, because because of Telegorm and Kurufin, <laughs> yeah, two of the major powers of Beleriand in Doriath and Nargothrond didn't send armies to join the Union of Maedros, um, which could have made a big difference because they... Which, they it would have made the difference. It, 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 because it of how that. close <laughs> they came, as it was, if Ulfang hadn't betrayed them. Mm -hmm. If they'd had those armies from Doriath and Nargothrond, but because of the actions of Kelagorm and Kurufin, those two places didn't send, um, didn't send armies. And yeah, <laughs> they have a lot to answer for, those two. So, so much. And, and also the fact that when he does do something wrong, if there's a chance he can fix something out of it, like, you know, he, he steps over a line, which is, you know, terrible, the line he steps over, but he, he feels yeah. it and he tries to rectify some part of it. And as much as you want to hate him from the deeds that he does, I think him and Maglor are definitely the most redeemable and understandable characters. Whereas, uh, you know, Kelagorm and Corfin are just like, there's no redeeming yeah. those guys. They, no. They're just like... They, they They do awful things that have absolutely nothing to do with the oath. Yeah, have nothing mm. to do with it at all. And, mm. and they do it to try to gain power or just mm -hmm. out of hate of... And they're, they're just... They talk nasty. Mm -hmm. Mythros talks respectfully and he something drives him to do something bad, but he's still respectful in a certain mm -hmm. sense. Like he'll talk respectfully until you get under his skin about the oath. Hello, Goma Corfin. They're talking crazy to you. They they're like calling you out your name. They, 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 even even though Eol's an asshole, they talk they're talking crazy to him. Uh, Corfin's talking crazy to him, and it was just like not necessary. Like it's like why are you talking to that man like that? Like, I mean, yeah, because it's like if if they'd known at that point, like what Eol had done to Ardadel. Then you could understand it, but they don't. He's they just don't. like, oh, it's just, just it's that weird dark elf guy. Dark elf, like it sounds very racist on some hate stuff. That's how I feel when I read it. Yeah, but like, like the, the way the way they use it, it yeah. is because to, to them dark, it's like, hi, yeah. God, yeah, it's derogatory. <laughs> like gen generally, it's and not. We don't mean dark thing, as in but... skin tone. Dark as he he yeah. dwelt in the forest. He didn't like the light. So before somebody mm -hmm. jumps out the window. With yeah, that. and before and dark as in the Moraquende, who were just the elves that didn't see the light of yeah, the two trees. The That's literally the difference between a light elf and a dark elf in Tolkien. Absolutely yes, and it, he and and specifically, so so you guys know, Aeol is specifically known as the dark elf, mm -hmm. as opposed to one of the dark elves, which are all the basically all of the Sindar except for Thingol. Yeah, all of the the the. Teleri elves are basically dark elves for yeah. the most part. Um, yeah. No so as you say, it was because yeah. it was because he yeah. all lived in the darkness of Nan Elmoth yeah. and he liked it there. So yeah. He liked he was, that. He also liked elf, weird things. He, he liked the wolves. Elf. He was like the dark elf also. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So the seven sons, um, you know, are, are the sons of Feanor, which is in itself, you know, a trip because Feanor ends up uh, you know, not being such a nice guy. And then after the Silmarils are stolen and his father killed, he loses it. He loses mm -hmm. it. And he already was, had a lot going on with his brothers. He didn't like his brothers. He also had a lot going on with the Valar. He was kind of like rebelling against them, like, you know, listening to the Morgoth kind of. So he, he was already like ready to try to go to Middle Earth. And it, and once he once he loses his father and loses the Silmarils, he snaps. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know what? We got to go get our symbols yeah. back, and he yeah. makes and his avenge sons. his father. Yeah, um, yeah, he, he I, makes I've his seen, sons take an oath. I've seen people make this thing about saying, "Oh, Feanor only went to Middle Earth; he only ever cared about the Silmarils." But it specifically says in the Silmarillion about how much of it was because of Finway. That it was something like no son has ever loved their father as much father as Feanor more. lived Finway. Like yeah. it was, he wanted to avenge his father, who Melkor had murdered. Um, yeah. easily as much as he wanted to retrieve the Silmarils. Um, like I think he, he, really I think he also says, uh, father. you know, he, he say, didn't y'all lose a king? Like he he doesn't understand. They're they don't want to go. Yeah. Like he has to hype them up, and he's like, yeah, he yeah, because they've like, just <laughs> lost their king or their their grandfather or their also their father in the case of Fingolfin and Fenarfin. 
So yeah, yeah, I get he doesn't understand why they're not like wanting to avenge him as well. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it's but, yeah, it's a crazy story, uh, which has uh, tons of ins and outs and other parts where you know Fanor is, is you know banned and he's he has to go to <laughs> Formanos and and yeah, and, and that's a whole thing in itself. And and Morgoth comes and destroys the two trees and. You know, he takes uh, the treasures from Formanos and he kills Fenway and steals the Silver Rose. So he wants revenge and he's going to go take it. And he basically riles up all the rest of the Noldor elves and even his brothers who were estranged from him a little bit. He got them on his side and they were like, oh, we're going to go. And he mm -hmm. gets Galadriel, even gets Galadriel, you know, to, you know, yeah. I want my lands of my own. He hypes her up in a bit and she's like, yeah, let's go. And they go to travel and then... But though I think that was already in her nature, that she of, kind of, of wanted course. that anyway. Um, yeah. yeah, it's like one of the few times that she actually agreed with Feanor on something. Yeah, yeah but when he yeah, was speaking, then, she was yeah. one of the... She was one yeah, of, she, she was she there was the amongst the princes of the yeah. Noldor as like leading the rebellion leading and saying, it. yeah, we need to go. She was definitely... Yeah, she was absolutely part of it. Um, yeah, so and then, in, yeah, in, in the Rings of the Power... Hour. Yeah, in the Rings yeah. of Power, sorry. In the Rings of Power... This is the Galadriel we're we're talking about, which we're kind of seeing, you know, the rebellious side of her, the more, you know, I'll do what I want type mm -hmm. of thing. They're kind of just trying to show so we can see an arc with Galadriel. In case you guys didn't know, what we're talking about with her right there is more of what they're trying to show you with her. So we can see an arc and we can see the change. Otherwise, yeah. it's like, what's the Otherwise, point? Otherwise, there's no story the if she just starts the beginning of the series being exactly the same character as she yeah. is at the end of it then yeah, yeah that's what we're seeing in rings power um but yeah then they they did the oath it was yeah. only feanor and his sons that did the oath Celebrimbor, who was feanor's grandson didn't do the oath thankfully the or he would have well he, he, he didn't have he didn't have a happy ending did he but it would have been less happy <laughs> a bit sooner he died like a g though he died like a g i i, I gotta give he him that. A, even yeah. though you know he didn't he didn't punk out for the most part you know what i mean no he didn't he was yeah. very brave so you know they do the, they do the oath and and mm -hmm. do you remember the oath, Callie Lee? Do you I've tried I've oath? tried to I tried to learn it and remember it to recite, but I haven't got it yet. But it's basically um, we will if anyone comes between us and the silver marrows, we will kill them. Damn us to the everlasting darkness if we don't retrieve the silver marrows. Uh, they swear on Iluvatar and um, they say, and hear and remember our vow, Manwe and Varda. Um, so yeah, it's so it's they, a they very swear, they swear. Like you, strong words. Once yeah. you swear on Iluvatar, that's it. You know, it's <clears throat> like a binding agreement. Like it's not, and they they say no matter yep. whether it's man, elf, <laughs> uh, monster, Valar, it doesn't matter who it is. They come if between, us comes and the between them and the Silmarils. All bets are off. So, yeah. Leonor takes his oath, and his seven sons take the oath, and this is where yeah. things go left. I I feel like if they'd been able to stop and think about it, they would have been yeah, this isn't a good idea. But in that moment when they're so riled up on grief and anger and just like the heat of the moment sort of thing, it seems like a good idea then to swear that oath. <laughs> yeah, I'll swear on the gods right say, now. <laughs> yo, let's listen to yeah. dad. They're, they're swearing the oath on their dad, and and they're doing, you know, and they follow him. And and first thing they get into is the kin slaying at Alqualande. That's a huge mistake. Yeah. So they slay their kin, the Teleri elves, at the shores of Alqualande. They take their ships. Then they 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 get banned. They get banned from Valinor, and. It's it's over for them. They can no longer come back unless they repent. They don't choose to repent. We're gonna have to give such the short version of this. But basically, they steal the boats from the rest of their kin, the the rest of the Noldor elves, the uh, Fingolfin's people, and Finarfin's people that are left. And they take the boats that they stole from the Teleri, and they sail near the Halkorax along the shores, and they and they they go to Middle Earth, you know, to get their revenge. And then they burn the freaking boats. Instead of sending them back for the host of Fingolfin and the host of Finarfin, they burden them. And it's only my Dross who doesn't participate yes. in this, my boy. Exactly. Um, what I was just because, about to say. One of the reasons he's, we love my Dross. Yeah, because he can see that this is wrong. And he, well, he specifically mentions Fingon because he was like besties with Fingon. And yeah. it's like, and yeah, so he has no part in this. He refuses to partake in the burning of the ships because he knows it's wrong and he tries to stop Feanor from doing it. But 
there's no talking down Feanor when he's got his mind set on something. So yeah, the the ships get burned, and then there's the what I mentioned earlier, where is there is the alternate version of the burning of the ships at Lost Guard, when I can never remember which one it is. Again, they're just, they're like just, but they're both Amberosa to me, non distinguishing them. But one one of the twins, it, it it find is hiding on the boats and gets killed in the burning of the ships at Lost Guard because he was trying to get back home. He wanted to go back to his mom. Um, and I like that version because I, I guess I just like tragedy. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, I like that version because it's so sad. Yeah. And I can just like imagine it so well, like the realization of the brothers and Feanor when they realize they've accidentally killed one of them. Um, yeah. And it's, it's very sad. It's very sad. And that's why probably why I like it. <laughs> but in the version that we we do have, we know that yeah, the Silmarillion that, version it doesn't happen. And um, now we have they they arrive in 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 Middle Earth, and immediately Morgoth is like, "Yo, attack them before they get they they can't fully set up. Let's just get them out of here." And Morgoth sends a force, a great force, to attack uh, you know Feanor and his his followers, and he catches them unawares. But it doesn't matter. They are just fresh out of the light of the two trees. They are wrathful and they are strong. And they wipe the orcs off the face of the earth. But Feanor yeah. being Feanor, being an asshole, being, you know, I feel being myself. fueled by anger and grief and, yeah. He drives he, far he, ahead of his peoples. Mm -hmm. And he gets caught out there and he gets surrounded by Belrogs. And he, even though he fights bravely and he's like undaunted at first it said like he's fighting all the, the, yeah. the bell rocks undaunted so just understand that feat in itself is no walking apart he's fighting mm. the bell rocks all of them undaunted and then he gets smitten by gothmog the lord of the bell rocks and the seven sons come up and they pull him out you know before he's you know fully killed but it, he's wounded mortally and mm -hmm. makes them double down they carry him you know to the mountains and they they he, he makes them double down on this oath before he passes away. And he just turns into Yeah, ash. before he just leaves them to he it without him. him. He's like, yo, yeah, and say this oath again. Yeah, and then he's just like, right, I'm a bounce now. <laughs> leave you to it. <laughs> he does, there's nothing to bury. He is the spirit of fire, truly. And he literally yeah. just... Yeah, what we were saying before about how Muriel put so much of herself into Feanor. His Feanor, his soul was so powerful that, yeah, it burn his body up as it was leaving his body um yeah. so yeah that was fair or spirit of fire indeed yeah so now now we got the seven sons that are in valerian and you know basically uh the kingship technically is taken by by, by my now mm -hmm. it's not supposed to be with him keep that in mind but he, he's the king i and... still disagree with you on that but we won't get into that now ah I still think it goes farther to sun. So it would no, be. No, 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 no. It doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. But whatever. This, no, it's this fine. Is we'll leave that for now. That's a, that's a whole we'll, other discussion. We'll but yeah. We'll be arguing from sundown to sun. <laughs> so, boom. They, now he's the, he's the king and um, his people are there. And uh, they both kind of like, Morgoth is like, yo, all right. They're very powerful. Mm. Like, let me, let me offer them a silver rule and say, yo, man, just go back. I'll give you one of the Silmarils. And, you know, he's yeah. setting up a meeting. Morgoth um, off, yeah, he offers a parlay. And... Of course, he's he's going to betray them. But Mithros does something interesting. He's also going to betray Morgoth when he's setting up the parlay. So both of them are like, yeah, like, like bump yeah. them. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to both, you know, betray each other, right? They, 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 they come with both to come with more force than they say. But Morgoth had the more. And he brought Balrogs and Mythros gets taken. Now, this part, I feel sorry for Mythros right here. Lee, what happens to Mythros? Mythros is taken to Angband, and first he spends 20 years captive in Angband, where it's not specified what happens to him, but I'm pretty sure it's not very nice. Well, and then eventually, right. after, after 20 years, he gets hung by the wrist from one of the cliffs of Thangoro Dream. Like, just hanging there and he's there for I think it's like 17 years that he's hanging there 
and he's an elf, so yeah. he can't like die from like regular shit. So like he's gonna just it's like torture, just, just boredom torture yeah. kind of yeah. Yeah, man, so. yeah. But his cousin, yeah. Now now his now his uncle and his and the rest of the Noldor elves, uh, Fingolfin's followers, and the, the rest of Finolfin's followers, Galadriel and uh, Finrod, and them they they arrive and and this is the, you know how's the coming of the sun and the moon and and they come and and they fight back you know the orcs and. Uh, eventually, Fingon, even though they were betrayed, he loves Mithros and he wants to heal the hurt between the two groups that Feanor caused. And he goes looking for Mithros. This is one of the most endearing moments. And this part, you don't care about what the Seven Sons did or Mithros did or Feanor. It's so good to see the, the, the hurt get repaired and what comes of it is even more miraculous. So Fingon goes and he finds uh, Mithros hanging from uh, Angband, um, you know, from uh, Thangaradrum by the wrist. Can you say about how he finds him as well? Because I find that really moving. Like Fingon has been searching for ages. He can't find him. He's pretty much given up hope. Mm -hmm. For some reason, he's took a, like a harp or a, lot, a little, I can't remember what it's called now, but you know, one of those little like lyre things. And he starts playing music on it. And Mithros hears it and sings and that's how he finds him yeah. and Mithros, um, Mithros answers and starts singing back to him yeah and, and that's how Fingon finds him um I find it interesting that Fingon had decided to take a musical instrument with him and the god that he's going to search but it's a good job he did yeah but yeah and then he he finds him and he can't get to him to release him because he's on this sheer cliff phase Fingon can't get there to release it to release him. So Mithros begs Fingon to shoot him with an arrow so that he can escape his torment. And Fingon is absolutely devastated at this, but he's gonna do it because he can't leave Mithros to suffer like that. So as he's aiming up his arrow, he says a prayer to Manwe to guide the arrow. Um but instead, Manwe sends the eagles and Fingon gets on the back of the eagle. The eagle carries him up to Mithros and he can't cut through the metal that's holding him. Yeah, it's called so a he hell rock to... bond. Like he can't, yeah. he can't cut through that shit. So he has to cut off Mithros' hand to free him, but he does manage to free him and take him away from Angband and back to safety and just that whole thing is devastating like the moment where Fingon thinks he's gonna have to shoot his best friend his cousin um who you know who he loves dearly it's it's devastating it's devastating <laughs> it's so it, sad it's, it it the, the release that he got to save him he's like yo he's gonna lose a hand yeah. but you're saved and he brings him back and straight away Mythros just does something so mm -hmm. to to show his thanks, he relinquishes the kingship from his line, from the the Feanorian line. He says, "It goes to you, Fingolfin, who is the eldest." Now, this is another thing he says, who's who always was, should have been the rightful king, being the eldest of the line of Fenway. So that's one of the reasons why I say that. Also, there's another reason, but we'll get into that another time, another argument. So. This is one of the things where you see wrong is done, but true love and the the trying to do good was there. He tried to yeah. to, to go back and get Fingon when the when the when the boats when he had the boats. He's like, "Yo, let's go get Fingon," and his father yeah. tells him no, and he starts burning the ships. So Mithros very much was a good guy. He loved his family, loved his cousin and his best friend, and he tried to get him. And that's who ends up saving him. And then he relinquishes. He says, "I don't even I don't even need the kingship." Fingolfin was allowing them him to be the king regardless because he had talked to his brother and he he said, "I'll follow you, brother," and he let Fing um. Feanor take the kingship because he was he was the king while Feanor was in exile. The exile never ended as well. So that's another reason why the line was in Fingolfin's thing. But Fingolfin let let Feanor have it, and he and that being said, he let he let Mithros have it, and then he got it back from him after his son uh, Fingon rescued Mithros. And you know it just makes you feel for Mithros. But 
one of the coolest things and Michaels doesn't get enough credit for is that being that he lost his hand, you would think he would be weak. He's malnourished from, um, you know, his time in Ang Band and, and hanging from Thing Rodrum. But it said he had such a fire in him that, you know, in time, he began, he began to wield his sword with his left hand more deadlier than his right. And he it, it was like he fought like there was a white, like, I can't remember the exact words, but like it was crazy. Mm -hmm. So the, the two groups eventually separated. So to to make sure there wasn't strife again, the Seven Sons of Feanor moved to East Balerion. Now, there's only two ways to get into the main part of Balerion in the south um, by these two passes, the Eastern Pass and the, and the Western Pass. So being that the Seven Sons of Feanor are the lords of East Balerion, they guarded the Eastern Pass, which is the easier way to get into Balerion. It's, it's wide open, and the only thing blocking it are these groups of hills. Uh, and right right at the top of uh, the Eastern Balerion, uh, the, the hills are, there's a giant hill no, known as Himring, and that's where Maethros sets up his uh, his fortress. And, you know, his brothers below him set up, you know, various, you know, blockades and ways to stop, you know, into the paths of uh, Eastern Balerion. But this is the the most easiest way and the, and the most common way for Morgoth to get into uh, Balerion. So just like Lee said, he put it upon himself to take the brunt of all the attacks, which says a lot about his character. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He was willing to put himself on the front line. Um, yeah. And to be the protection of Balerion, to be Balerion's shield. Um, as, as the kind of person he was. So, so like, you know, like I said, it, it's just this common theme of, you know, Good deeds, bad deeds, good deeds, bad deeds. But you can't. It's not as simple as just, oh, he did that, and we hate him. A especially mm -hmm. with those, those two M's. Especially with those two M's. Yeah. So, I love talking about the Seven Sons, um, especially, especially uh, Mitros, because you know he has he's such an interesting character. So and to I, think I really some people him. criticize Tolkien's writing as all the characters being too black and white, good or bad. And then, you know, there's all these ridiculous shades of grey in Feanor and his sons. Ridiculous. And people will argue to this day, uh, Feanor did nothing wrong. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And in, in instances, you can completely understand. They asked him to break over the Silmarils and, and heal the two trees. And like, yo, that'll break my, that'll kill me. Like, I made something and I can never make it again. And like, even, mm. even um, Aule understands. He's like, hold up. Y'all don't know what you're asking him. So yeah. we get it. It's not as simple as black and white with these, mm -hmm. um, you know, except except for with the seas. It's, it's black and white. Yeah, you, no. Yeah, there's no there's no defending Kalagorm and Kudufin. Uh, should we talk about what they do? Because we talked about how, you know, the good Mithros does, but what the seas get up to. Firstly, um, with their attempted coup of pause, Nargothrond. Pause, pause, pause. Pause, pause, pause. This is what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break this episode into two parts. So when we do talk about uh, the seas, we can give them our full attention because usually yeah. our episodes run about 60 minutes or so. And we're coming up on, near to the end. And I don't want us to rush talking about them. So if we can get you to, to get another hour out of you and we're going yeah, to of course. Have you fully, fully explain the, the two seas. We do, the three C's. We don't really need to talk too much about Amrod and Amros because they really don't do anything. They, really except do. they don't do anything <laughs> except die. They're just the also there. <laughs> They're just there. They follow behind their brothers. But it would be a disservice to the C's to not give the full. They do a lot of shit. Literally, yeah, they, do. they mm -hmm. are the they are the cause of the down. To be honest, they are the cause of the downfall of the elves. Yeah, I, if we're really looking at it, like they caused the downfall of a lot of shit. They they caused the downfall of a lot of shit. So to get into what we're, is going to happen, they caused the downfall of freaking the the union of Mathros. They caused yeah, the downfall I mean, they're, they're of the reason Nargothra. that the they're the reason that Native Nyathornoidiad happened. Because yeah. they, they, yeah, they stopped the forces of Doriath and Nargothron joining the Union of Maedros. They, and, um, and they kind of caused the death of Finrod, if we're being fair. Yeah. 
Because he would have uh, left with more people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's possible they may have not been captured or whatever the case may have you. Mm. Def they definitely contribute to the death of Finrod. Yeah, they contribute they to wanted the downfall. to take over. Yeah, they, contri they contribute to everything. They, oh man, they're, they are, they are just. All I know is you got to be a pretty bad dude for your dog to leave you. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, we, and we get to talk about who won and how the Valinor. Yes. Yes. Good that deserves story. a whole episode by itself. Yeah. He does. <laughs> <laughs> so if I can ask you this question before we get into the seas, who is your favorite of the seas? And it doesn't have to be for because they're good. It could be because okay. they're interesting. Okay. If you're doing it as an interesting character, um, I would probably say Caligorn. Um, I hate him, but he's an interesting character because at the whole, you know, him being so close to Arome and everything, um, the talking to animals, the Huan thing, and then how much he seems to change um, to the point that Huan can't stand to be with him anymore. Yeah, he's like, um, oh, bump this yeah. dude. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, now, nah, mate. <laughs> Very interesting. I think out of the three, Karen Thier probably is my favorite, and I like I like his um I think he's smart in a sense. Mm. Um he's the one that like, okay, we can get this from the dwarves. I'm gonna utilize their our proximity to the dwarf road. Um he's mm. the one who uh gets basically the help of the dwarves of Belagost and and uh Nagrod in, in the in the fighting. Um he's the one who first is like, yo, these men, they could they we could fuck with them, like we could they could help us out. Like he he he's very he, I think he's very smart in a in a certain mm. sense. Um, his land where he has is I think it's 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 dope how much land he has. I think he has the most land out of the brothers. Um, yeah, yeah, by far I think he has the most land out of the brothers. Um, and you know it's not said that he was like some tyrant you know or something like that. Like mm. um, I just think he's very interesting. Um, I don't like how he treats the dwarves at all though. I don't like no. that about him. Um, but that also shows that he's he has depth to his character where he's like he knows to you know use them for but he he said he he talks very nasty to them where it's like it's not just like okay guys you know like yeah come on like you know let's get your stuff let's be happy together where which I know that would be ideal and I would love that but it shows that you know he's kind of manipulative too like he knows what to get mm. out of what you know to do and you know he's like pay pay tribute you're coming through my lands you know, give me these riches and this stuff like this all right now come come fight for us and this down the third and i just think it's it's interesting but when he's faced with yeah. the reality of hey these humans held off these orcs and, and it, it could have been bad for us because they could have came to our our rear and flanked us and you guys survive for seven days and you know what yo they they are they are they are valiant and stuff. You know what? You can dwell yeah. on my lands. He's if like you need genuinely impressed by that was, them. He was genuinely impressed, and I thought that was really dope of him. Mm. Um, you know what I'm saying? So I think there's depth there. Um, it shows that he is open to, you know, changing, having himself proven wrong or changing his mind on things. Yeah. But I don't like Yo, don't be talking about my boy Finrod's mom like that, yo. I don't like that <laughs> shit, man. He was talking crazy about Finrod's mom mm. and Galadriel's mom and them. And yo, mm. ben, yo, who was it? Angrod Angra was about to raise up on him. Angrod did not yeah. like that shit. No, we don't play him. Wow. Yo, he was like, yo, I thought it was going to go down. Um, but Mythros was like, yo, chill, chill. Once again, and Mythros breaking up a situation that could have went left and everything yep. like that. So, um, we are going to break this episode up into two parts because I, I would be remiss not to do so because Lee has so much information on the Seven Sons, even just their mother names, things like that I don't know um, that 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 I'm learning about. And um, she, she's just letting us know so much. And it would be so terrible to just not talk about the three C's and like full volume and all their deeds and misdeeds. Um, so we're going to break this episode into two parts. So we will see you guys back after this episode drops. And I say about maybe a, a week or so later, we'll drop the second part of the episode. If that's cool with you guys, Lee, if you don't mind coming back for another episode, talking with me. Maybe no, my bit. pleasure. You know, I'll never miss an opportunity to talk Tolkien. 
we want to thank you very much for uh, being a part of, um, you know, saying Voices of Arda and um, joining us. I know you got a lot of things going on in your life. You're a very busy, busy, busy lady, and you are um, just just an awesome in, in general. And you, I know oh. you got a lot going for you. So keep doing what you're doing. Uh, our time difference is crazy. So thank you for allowing us Ooh. to take out the time of your day, which is much later than it is over here. Um, <laughs> thanks to Callie. Thanks to Callie for being the everything of the podcast, you know, holding us together and and telling her little corny stinking jokes. Um, <laughs> oh, that was a good one. I like that one. I knew you'd like that one, Lee. Thank you. <laughs> I think she's like the eighth, uh, you know, I think she's the daughter of Fanor. She's like, <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the nonsense. Um, so, you know, at the end of the second episode, we're going to get into uh, Callie's self-care tips. And yeah, we're going to that. also get into, you know, uh, the wonderful questions I had to ask Lee about the elves and mm-hmm. the uh, the men and the Valar and all of, all of those cool things, the dwarves, anybody, any characters in the Lord of the Rings. And, and we'll get into all that good stuff. So when we come back, part two of episode two, uh, season two of the Voices of Arda. We're going to get back into the seven sons of Feanor, the three C's. So I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you for joining us and take care. Thank you so much to both of you and to all our listeners. Thank you. Thank you for having me. (laughs)